Hi, I'm Declan Walsh. I'm the Chief Africa Correspondent for the New York Times. Um, previously, I was the Middle East, a Middle East correspondent based here in Egypt. And before that, I was in Pakistan, where I focused on topics of political and social change. Um, in this session, we're going to be discussing factors that both compound climate change and distract from action and progress, namely the rise of authoritarianism, the decline in Democratic, of democratic values in many parts of the world and the human and human rights violations. Um, too often, these symptoms hit hardest in vulnerable countries that are already prone to the worst impacts of climate change. What is the reality of climate change within countries where climate freedoms are compromised and the opposition is silenced? And what are the prospects for progress? I'm delighted to say that we have a stellar panel with us here this evening to discuss this, and I'd like to welcome on stage Jason Bordoff, who is the co-founding dean of the Columbia Climate School and the founding director of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. We also have Mitzi Tan, who is a Filipino climate justice activist And I'm also delighted to welcome Nazni Moshiri, who is a senior analyst at the Crisis Group for Climate and Security in Africa. And she's going to be joining us virtually from Nairobi. Um, unfortunately, we'd been hoping to have Susanna Mohammed, the Environment, Environment Minister of Colombia, here with us this evening. Uh, but she informed us uh, uh, that she's unable to join us. And we're hoping that she'll come back to us later in the week to, for a moment. So thanks to everyone for being here. Before we jump into the conversation, a quick note to say that we're going to be taking audience questions throughout. So um, please make, write your comments on the cards that you're going to find on, on the seat beside you um, and make yourself known to our mic runners and I'll do my best to weave any questions you have into our discussion. Um, this is a vast topic, so I'm going to focus it on two main areas. Firstly, we're going to look at how progress on climate change is hampered under authoritarian rule and other fraught political contexts, and how the impacts of climate change are exacerbated by war and conflict. Secondly, we'll turn to, look, to exploring how democratic principles can climate, um, I'm sorry, can strengthen climate progress. Um, and we are going to start with the, we're going to start with the challenges. Um, Jason, in your role at the um, Columbia University Climate School and your focus on energy policy globally, if you could speak to the fact that we have a multitude of conflicts in the world today. Sorry, uh, I've got two mics going on. Um, I'm just going to stand over here. We've got a multitude of conflicts in the world today. Um, Russia's war in Ukraine comes top of mind, but of course there are others. Could you speak a little bit to how you see um, conflict feeding into other crises that affect global energy and food systems. So we've been doing these for a long time because this is number 27. And uh, other than a pandemic or a recession, I think emissions have gone up each and every year that we've been doing this. So we're not doing particularly well by the metric that matters most, which is bringing emissions down. So uh, despite various forms of progress on the whole for goals like net zero 2050 or targets like one and a half degrees Celsius warming, we're failing at climate security. And when you look around the world now, in many parts of the world, not just Europe, we're failing at energy security too. Uh, we sort of, I think, became relatively complacent, took abundance and affordability of energy for granted. And uh, then we had Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which was a precipitating and exacerbating factor. We should place blame where it's due, which is at the feet of Vladimir Putin for his unjustified aggression in Ukraine. But it came on top of a base of underlying factors that made it uh, made the possibility of weaponizing energy greater. We were, had tight markets. Uh, we were not investing enough, certainly in clean energy. Uh, and so there was, there's very little buffer. There's very little margin for error in the global energy market. And so when you have any disruption, something goes wrong and has outsized impacts. And now we're in a more uh, 
connected and integrated global energy market than we were, say, when the Arab oil embargo happened a half century ago. And that means the ripple effect, that, so there's security that is provided by that. If you have a disruption, you can go into a global market and pull supplies in. But it also means that there are ripple effects. So as we see Europe pulling in more supplies of natural gas, prices for gas are going up through the roof. and. Europe pays a high price, but countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh see rolling blackouts and difficulty affording any energy. And these are the parts of the world that are most impacted by climate uh, at the same time, as we saw from the devastating flooding in Pakistan. Even coal prices are at record levels. Um, European fertilizer production is down 70%. That's going to have devastating impacts on food security around the world. So this cascading series of effects. And that, to the topic of this panel, affects political stability, uh, the ability to maintain public support uh, for governments, maintain public support for a clean energy transition and the sort of strong, much stronger climate policies we need. If people have trouble meeting basic energy needs or paying uh, their energy or heating bills or gasoline prices, there's a risk that, that, that climate ambition will wane. And so we need to make sure that we're doing these multiple things at the same time, meeting people's energy needs securely, affordably, reliably, uh, and dramatically accelerating uh, the pace at which we're putting clean energy into the market. Um, when we look in so many parts of the world now, we see democratic backsliding, um, liberal democracy on the wane. You know, you had, of course, the assault on the U.S. Capitol after the 2020 election in the U.S. Um, Turkey's President Erdogan cracking down on dissent as a way of solidifying his own power. Um, a whole range of countries in Africa where uh, either have either turned to authoritarianism or where um, elections are seen as rubber stamp exercises by much of the population. How does this kind of backsliding translate into the progress, uh, into progress rather on the, on, on climate, climate issues? Um, I'll say a word and then obviously would, would uh, love to hear from the rest of the panel too on this. I mean, I think um, former British Foreign Secretary David Miliband has written about an age of impunity in various parts of the world. We do unfortunately see autocrats uh, hands that are strengthened, and uh, I think that in order to, in order to have, and the data shows this. There's a series of academic studies about this, demonstrating that, uh, broadly speaking, not there is any one data point here or there, or one example here or there. But leaving anecdotes aside, on the whole, uh, countries that are more open, where political freedoms are stronger, where democracy is stronger. Uh, tend to have better track records on both climate and environment and sustainability more broadly. And I think in order to sustain support for the kind of whole-scale economic transformation that we need in many parts of the world to see a clean energy transition, you need whole-of-society buy-in. You need public acceptance, uh, A, that this is a source of critical concern. Certainly, we're not there yet, even in democracies. My, our, my own country of the U.S. is pretty divided on this issue, unfortunately. Um, but to, but to have have, to have po political approaches that are durable and sustainable, it's really important to have the public's buy-in for the, gov the approaches that government is taking uh, and, 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 and the kind of, it, it is, it, the consequences of inaction clearly are greater. We have to act because the consequences of climate themselves, more severe droughts and flooding and the consequent conflict and migration, those will have significant uh, forms of political instability. But the energy transition itself, if we have a much faster one, which we need to, uh, will also be a source of instability and geopolitical risk. You need to maintain public support for the need to have this kind of transition if you want to get there in the time frames we need to. Do, do, you, do, you, ever, do you ever think there's a possibility in some places where uh, you know, public opinion could push because of the pain of the climate transition, could push towards more authoritarian rule in some places. Is that a, da a risk? I think, it is, I think it is a risk. Um, I, I, I think we, we, we have seen populist leaders in different parts of the world, I think, take advantage of um, economic pain, uh, pursue populist approaches. Uh, some of that is connected uh, directly or indirectly to the consequences of climate change. And I think when... Uh, when, when, when less democratic leaders are looking for political, to be political opportunism, I, th I think that um, the, the consequences that populations will face 
uh, when 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 climate impacts are not uh, are not are not addressed, and we're going to see that on the agenda these two weeks. Issues of loss and damage, issues of adaptation, are just higher on the agenda because we have not been making the progress we need to, and we're seeing each and every year those those severe impacts get worse. Let's see if we could turn to you um, and the Philippines. The Philippines now in a new era. You have a new president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., son, of course, of the uh, dictator. Um, Ferdinand Marcos, who was ousted in a revolt in 1986. Um, what's it like, what was it like being a climate activist in the Philippines under Rodrigo Duterte? And how has that changed under the new leader? Or how do you anticipate it changing in the future? With Rodrigo Duterte, we saw that environmental defenders and activists were called terrorists. Even before him, the Philippines has always been one of the most dangerous countries in the world for environmental defenders and activists. And small farmers are being bombed to this day with cannons. And it's not being reported on in media. The military says that they're using precise instruments to kill off terrorists, but they're not. They're using bombs that are going onto land, into farmlands, into the forests, into cities and communities of people. This has happened in Duterte. This is happening still with Marcos Jr. And Marcos Jr. calls himself a climate leader in, in every international conference, talks about how climate justice and talks about the historical responsibility of global North countries. But when you look at his actions, he leaves behind the people most marginalized every single time. There is a land defender and activist called Karina de la Serna, and she was arrested three years ago when she was 18 years old, along with 120 human rights activists and land defenders. And to this day, they are still in prison for crumped up charges. And it's not just happening in the Philippines, it's happening across the world, even here in Egypt, where people fighting for their rights and fighting for the planet are being incarcerated. And we cannot have climate justice without social justice. You said there's not much of a conversation about some of these issues and these injustices taking place in the Philippines. Is that because of restrictions on the press or are there other factors? With Duterte and even here with Marcos Jr., one of the biggest press um, companies in the Philippines was shut down, actually. And they're constantly attacking the other press companies that, are, that have a more critical view on the government. And we're seeing how even with the recent UN Human Rights Council report calling out the red tagging, which is basically calling activists terrorists or terror tagging, and telling and encouraging the government to look into the human rights issues in the Philippines, they continue to ignore it and say that red tagging is a form of freedom of speech for the government. So let that sink in, that the government thinks to call activists terrorists is a part of their freedom of speech. To shut off our freedom of speech is their freedom of speech. Under, under the last president, Duterte, he often seemed to speak a big game in international fora. He made a lot of uh, pretty strong statements about the need for climate justice, climate action. Um, groups like Greenpeace, though, said that was just for show, and that, for instance, I think there had been a moratorium on new coal production, uh, which was broken, um, and that there were a few meaningful policies. What does this tell us about how climate change, what are the linkages between climate change and democratic governance? You can't have climate justice without democratic governance. And we have to remember that these totalitarian and fascist leaders, they're not acting alone. They're puppets of countries like the US. They're puppets like countries like the US to continue the profit of the multinational companies in our countries for that imperialist plunder. We can't pretend that these countries that have these horrible leaders, and mostly in the global south, are acting alone because it's for it makes us forget about the colonial past and present that's still happening today. Yes, often it is in these democratic countries that have better climate tracts, but where have they exported their exploitation? Into our homes, into our communities. And we cannot forget that historical injustice that's happening until today whenever we talk about climate action and climate justice. That's a, an aspect of global politics. Nazanin, if I could turn to you um, to talk a little bit about political responsibilities at the local level. Um, in some parts of Africa, you'll see cash crops being grown and exported in one part of a country and famine-like conditions in another place. We see this in Sudan and South Sudan and Somalia, even parts of Kenya. Um, I appreciate that's 
partly a product of international food markets, but also appears to point to a lack of accountability and marginalization of some groups. What do you see as the role of business and political elites in these countries at the intersection of climate and food issues? Yeah, you make a really good point there. Um, and we see this uh, in, in Somalia, for example, which is going through uh, a potential famine in two districts in the country with 300,000 people um, facing famine-like conditions um, and more than a million people displaced, but they see you know, cash crops being grown along the mo more um, lush and fertile parts of the country. Um, I think part of it is, of course, accountability. Um, part of it is, of course, governance as well, governance issues. Um, in the case of uh, parts of the Horn of Africa, um, so areas that I've been looking at in my research, so uh, northern Kenya, um, you know, eastern Uganda, South Sudan, uh, parts of Ethiopia, and of course, Somalia, uh, you do have issues of governance, um, and uh, that's both at a national and local level as well. Um, and also populations who've been marginalized for absolutely uh, generations um, and really have no trust or belief, uh, not only in, in the local system or gov of governance, but also in the central system of governance too. Um, so I think that is one of the main issues that we see in many of these regions. Um, if we can turn quickly to the issue of climate finance, um, can you speak a little bit to the specific complications about uh, authoritarian regimes or authoritarian leaders receiving climate finance? Does it, is, is that an issue for financiers or funders now? Um, and do you see any prospect of that changing into the future? Yeah, so in terms of climate financing, um, many countries, uh, particularly uh, in the global south, um, are basically suffering from a lack of climate financing. So whether they have authoritarian governments, uh, corrupt governments, um, uh, or conflict, they are basically um, suffering from, from you know, a lack of, of climate financing per capita. So um, there is a huge gap there. Um, and obviously, when we look at these countries, um, political violence and instability complicate things even more. Um, so the climate financing mechanisms or organizations are pretty reluctant or even refuse, in some cases, to fund projects um, in situations where there may be you know, corruption, um, you may have armed conflict, you may have instability, um, and also, uh, you know, you have sort of less obvious obstacles too. You know, poor governance, for example, can prevent a state from getting access to the climate financing um, or getting, you know, the accreditation they need uh, to do that. So uh, you do have some international agencies working around these issues in certain countries and certain states um, and administering money directly, you know, obviously with the state's permission and carrying out the, the climate adaptation. Um, we see this, for example, in South Sudan um, and in Somalia too. Um, but uh, these kinds of issues are really prominent, particularly in countries um, that are suffering from conflict. So conflict really is more of an issue, I would say, than whether there is political freedom in that country. I mean, uh, listening to you speak, it strikes me that you know, some of the issues that have bedeviled international aid efforts in parts of Africa for many decades about ensuring that aid is delivered with transparency um, and gets to the people who need it, to some degree may apply to climate financing. Uh, but clearly a big difference is that the the in future, the private sector is likely to be a lot more involved. And we see in many parts of Africa, um, you know, international finance financiers or funders coming in. Um, I mean, that's a somewhat contentious issue, I think, on, on, on its own. Uh, but for the purposes of our conversation, I was just wondering whether you think um, some of those issues, you know, what kind of framework there might be for ensuring that there is accountability for, uh, you know, for funds that may come, uh, or rather, actually, let, let's just talk about the private sector. You know, what sort of rules or framework should there be for the private sector to come in 
uh, and invest in countries that may have troubling uh, human rights or political records. You look at East Africa, you know, Rwanda under President Kagame presents itself as a leader in many of these areas and yet is one of the most repressive regimes in the, in the region. Yeah, interesting. You, you mentioned Rwanda and, um, you know, Rwanda is, as you say, committed to low carbon growth. Um, and, you know, they've, they've adopted, uh, you know, climate change strategy, etc. cetera. Um, but at the same time, they have the worst human rights record um, according to some rights groups uh, in, in the region. Um, I think there has to be a way to close these climate financing gaps. Um, and there has to be a way to sort of revise the current criteria, I guess, for accessing climate financing. Um, and the methodologies, I would say, for assessing the risk and the ways of, of working, um, particularly in places affected by uh, you know, political freedoms or affected by conflict or affected by corruption, uh, for example. I mean, in terms of the private sector, they are very risk averse. So they're certainly uh, not going to be um, investing their money in, in places where they think um, there could be political instability or there could be you know, armed conflict uh, or other types of conflict. So there are obvious obstacles there. Um, but I think definitely um, there has to be a sort of rethink in terms of climate, climate financing um, for, these, for these regions. Uh, thank you very much. And um, listening to the contribution so far, it strikes me that, you know, a lack of political freedom in a country often leads to the silencing of climate activism. And of course, one of the strongest examples of that is arguably here in Egypt, where all forms of activism or political opposition have largely been criminalized. Um, and as anyone who's been reading the papers will know, one of the country's best known political prisoners uh, Allah Abdel Fattah is on hunger strike at the moment in an effort to win his freedom. Um, his sister spoke at a press conference earlier today here in Sharm el Sheikh. What, and I'll throw this open to all of you, what is your perspective on the decision of the COP27 to situate itself in Egypt? I think that no amount of greenwashing will ever have us climate activists forget about the human rights violations that's happening here. At its heart, climate justice is about protecting people, especially the ones most marginalized. And if we have governments that are silencing people, then we will not have climate justice. We cannot have climate justice without social justice. We have said that over and over and over. It is about time that they finally understand that that means releasing all political prisoners, not just here in Egypt, but across the world. We are fighting for a better world where everyone feels safe and no one feels left behind. And that means getting rid of this imperialist, profit-oriented system that prioritizes the multinational companies, the fossil fuel industry, every single time. Jason, Nazmi. Yeah, I mean, look, um, there's plenty of evidence uh, to show that, that systems that allow civil participation, free flow of information um, are more capable uh, in, de than de in dealing with issues of complexity like the climate crisis that we're all facing. So, um, you know, generally from my experience as a journalist and now as a senior analyst at Crisis Group, it's clear that citizens need to be well informed, educated, etc. And it's highly unlikely that authoritarian, non-democratic states are going to focus on what's best for their citizens. Um, and clearly, justice and equal rights are, are really essential. But that's not to say that democracies, too, can't be manipulated. Um, and we see that, as was mentioned from the lobbying of the fossil fuel industry. Um, they've allowed economic actors to capture you know, policy making. Sometimes we see um, the public being misled on scientific facts, for example. Um, and also, you know, there are other weaknesses as well. Uh, we see, you know, democratic decision making very politically focused, you know, focused on political cycles, on elections. Um, so we do see some deficiencies and, and limitations in, in democracies too. Um, but clearly, 
you know, open and democratic societies a better place you know, to access and spread information on what we need in terms of climate change um, and organize and form protests, express opinions, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, better place to mobilize people uh, so they can demand climate justice an action that we've just heard about. But on this specific point about um, Egypt, I mean, it strikes me, you can look at this question from two sides, Jason. Uh, you have, you know, a country like Egypt uh, will have a policy on climate change, will also wish to use an event like this one to uh, project a particular image of itself. From the perspective of the UN or the organizers of a conference like this, they may, um, they may see the need to bring ensure that you know, a broad range of countries are platforms for this conversation, even those that have troubling records. How do you think the UN should balance those two, um, those two dynamics? Yeah, I mean, we, we need to engage a very large number of countries if you're going to make climate progress, because it doesn't matter where a ton of CO2 emissions come from, and that means engaging with countries um, with whom we may rightly have concerns about democratic records and human rights uh, records. Being in Egypt is personal for me. This is where my family is from, where my mother grew up, where her family uh, grew up until most of their assets were frozen and they left uh, by ship to come to the U.S. Uh, in search of more freedom, uh, in this case because of their religion and the policies of Egypt uh, toward the Jewish community in the 1950s. And so that, that's a personal connection. Uh, understanding the, 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 the impact that lack of those political freedoms and democratic norms can have on, on, on communities and, and on individual uh, families. We need to uh, condemn that wherever we see it. Um, that's true for how we think about the kind of clean energy economy we need to build. I mean, the question, the way this was framed, the question of the panel, can we have climate progress without, without political uh, freedom? Um, but what we have, what we have, even if, I don't, the answer is not yes, the answer is no, but even if the answer were yes, that doesn't mean that one should celebrate a lack of political freedom. We can care deeply about climate change and care deeply about human rights and democratic norms and pursue all of them simultaneously and recognize that if the country that makes the cheapest solar panels you can buy does it with slave labor, that might be a problem because we care about climate, but we have other values as well. And as we think about the kind of political power that some countries have derived from the hydrocarbon economy we've had since the Industrial Revolution, that may change. Some of those political powers may, may wane over time. New forms will emerge, right? Where's all the mining going to happen for the significant increase in critical minerals that we're going to need, lithium, nickel, cobalt? Which countries are going to be the places we go to develop those resources? What kind of ways are we going to see uh, social norms and economic inequality and, and, and freedoms um, potentially mismanaged uh, with that new clean energy economy? There are risks there as well. So we're going to have to be, pay really careful attention to those and call out problems uh, where we see them and make sure that the rules of the road for the clean energy economy, hopefully from the standpoint of political freedom, governance, uh, the, the S and the G, as well as the E and ESG, uh, get the attention that they deserve. On solar panels, um, another country where these issues collide, most obviously, is in China. Um, you know, a country where the system of rule has allowed the government to quickly mobilize resources and people you know, to help to take measures, develop industries that are aimed to you know, make money, but also to stave off climate change. Um, China produces the most solar panels of any country in the world, as you know, and yet those panels, um, they rely on components that are made largely in Xinjiang, where there have been reports of um, programs that employ Uyghur, I'm sorry, where reports suggest that programs employing Uyghur laborers are actually forced labor. So I guess my question is, and I'll turn to Nazneen um, or Mitzi for this, what do you think should be the balance between the need for, uh, for goods and resources that will help us to shift to renewable energies and to guard against human rights abuses? Nazneen, I'll turn to you first. Yeah, I mean, 
Um, I thought it was really encouraging just recently, the UN General Assembly for the first time recognized the human rights, huge margin, like 161, I think, um, to zero. Um, so we do see um, some progress on, on that front. Um, but th at the same time, uh, we do see that the burden um, of, of the harms of climate change uh, in terms of human rights are not spread equally. Um, so we do see, as the example that you gave, uh, you know, components, and we see this, you know, where I am in, in, East, in East Africa, components for, um, you know, solar, system, solar panels, etc., uh, coming in from, from places like uh, China, um, and, you know, Africa, and what we're seeing right now, the drought um, in the Horn, Africa basically bearing the brunt um, of emissions which are being created by these industries. Um, so it, it is deeply unfair um, and the global south suffers disproportionately um, and it suffers disproportionately as well from you know, climate related violence which is what I've been looking to into as well. Um, actually if we can look forward quickly Mitzi, um, what are you and other climate justice activists demanding from the new government in the Philippines? And are there any plans that you're aware of for redressing historical infringements of human rights related to um, environmental or climate change actions? From the new government in the Philippines, our demands are to completely change the government. I have no... I, there will be no climate justice under Marcos Jr. But while he's there, we are calling on him to actually make true to his promises to reduce carbon dioxide emission, to call out the governments of the global north, and to stop the imperialist plunder, and to get rid of and repeal the Anti-Terrorist Act, to repeal the, 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 anti -mining, the, the mining law of 1995, these laws that have historically contributed to the human rights violations and the environmental destruction of our country. But in terms of redressing and addressing the human rights violations in the Philippines, there's nothing that's happening with our government now. There are movements from grassroots movements. There, there are people who are pushing for this, but it isn't happening. Instead, we are being silenced. Our farmers are being bombed. Our activists are still in prison. And what he does is he goes across the world in these conferences and calls for climate justice, but doesn't do anything on the ground. And what we need is real climate justice, and that's not going to happen under fascist leaders. Not here in the Philippines, but not everywhere across the world. Thank you. Um, Jason, at the start, you talked about some of the risks of uh, the needs of climate change tilting political systems to the right in some countries. Have you also seen countries that stand out where you know, climate change has gone hand in hand with democracy? democratization? Climate action? Uh, climate action, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah well, it's, um, <laughs> there are certainly cases of it. We, we, haven't, we don't have as many as we would want because we haven't seen nearly enough climate progress. So trying to call out which countries are making uh, the fastest progress is hard because so few are on track for their targets of net zero by, by 2050. Um, you know, I think... Uh, there are some encouraging trends. We're seeing the uh, historic record investments in clean energy uh, this year, and in response to the severe energy crisis in Europe, and Europe in many ways was already leading in uh, trying to put stronger climate policies in place, uh, advance government investments in clean energy, move faster than many other parts of the world, although albeit still not fast enough toward a net zero economy. And I think a big question was going to be whether, and still remains, uh, whether this energy crisis is going to lead to countries sliding back and saying we have to go to coal or diesel or build new natural gas facilities, or say there are th some things we'll need to do for, as an emergency basis to make sure we can heat homes this winter and next, but we don't miss this opportunity to now combine the urgency of climate action with the urgency of energy security to facilitate an even a faster transition to clean energy. The, the urgency of, of energy security is a very powerful one. We see governments jumping through hoops when they can't meet basic energy needs. And now I think you, you I, I, there, there's, 
there's a, uh, there's a promise, we don't know if it'll yet be fulfilled, uh, for things like repower uh, EU in the European Union to say, when it don't really takes 10 years to site and permit a renewable energy project, you have to get it done within one now because it's not only important for decarbonization, but it's important for European energy security if you're gonna do without Russian gas. And on and on, can we dramatically increase and accelerate uh, the policy, regulatory regime, the invent incentives, the investments, obviously the US certainly has not done enough, but we just saw nearly $400 billion of the Inflation Reduction Act, the largest ever US government investment in clean energy. So can, can we, 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 will, we will never forgive ourselves as we look back on this moment of energy crisis yeah. and climate crisis combining at the same time and think we missed the opportunity to combine those two urgencies, those two imperatives, to say if we were less dependent on globally traded hydrocarbons inevitably exposed to geopolitical risk, uh, if it's not Russia, next time it'll be something else, you know, that not only points you in the right direction for climate, but in many cases makes you more energy secure as well. Um, we're going to turn to questions from the audience. Um, we've received, if, if you have any more, please hand them to uh, one of our colleagues who are going around. Uh, we have one question for the panel saying, where do you see the potential areas of climate policy collaboration between more authoritarian countries and liberal democratic ones at COP27? <laughs> Mitzi, have you seen any of that? I haven't seen any true international collaboration in any of the, co the COPs or the UN climate summits. If we saw that, we wouldn't be in this mess, right? Where have I seen true international collaboration in events like this, in protests when we were allowed to, within activists and within civil society? That is where true international collaboration is. I've seen small island nations, in the panel previously we had Tuvalu up here, and they have been pushing, and there we've seen collaboration among the small island nations, but it is the global north countries that have been trying to escape the liability, the compensation, the responsibility that they have to pay up. It's as simple as if they broke something, they have to pay for it. And for some reason, they can't get that through their head. Thank you. Um, Jason, you, you got in late last night, um, but <laughs> do you see, if you've not seen it, do you see any potential for uh, collaborations between authoritarian and liberal con democratic countries at this conference or, or does the structure even lend yeah. itself to that kind of coming together? It's hard. I mean, that is the yes. purpose of the UNFCCC process. Yeah. The tragedy of the commons, again, it doesn't matter where a ton of CO2 comes from if one country acts on climate but, but, others, uh, but others don't. Um, you know, there's a free rider problem and, and those sorts yeah. of concerns. Nearly a third of emissions come from China. So there's no long-term solution to the climate crisis that doesn't involve a fundamental transition and, 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 and different kind of economy uh, that China has going forward than, than the one that it's had in the past. That was held out as um, uh, an, uh, an, an, a potential for cooperation. Uh, between the U.S. and China. That's what the U.S. envoy John Kerry talked about when Biden came into office. And it's been really strained by the fact that U.S.-Chinese relations are at one of their lowest points, in part because of many of these other uh, deeply challenging elements in the relationship over issues like uh, human rights and, and, and the Uyghurs and just broadly trade protectionism in general and Taiwan and a host of other things. So, so it makes it a lot harder. Um, but, but I think when you look at, we heard um, a moment ago about how dramatic the needs are for clean energy finance, for example. Uh, we need to go to something like three, four trillion dollars a year of investment in clean energy every year for the next uh, 30 years. Uh, the majority of that will be in emerging and developing economies and the majority of that will be private, not public financing, but public finance institutions will have to work together to think about how to catalyze more private investment there. I think there are ways in which we can see international, we see the international community working together um, even when you're Politi fundamental political systems differ uh, towards some of those multilateral financial institution investments to, to catalyze that finance. But I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. It's severely strained by how difficult it is to work together when you have uh, fundamentally different views about issues like, like democracy and human rights. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. But before we go, I just wanted to come to you, Mitzi. You talked a moment ago about the power of protest as a driver of change. 
how do you see your ability to protest here at COP? Is that at this COP? Is that sufficient for you? What what are you planning to do for the next days? In the next few days, we'll be seeing a lot of creative actions inside the blue zone because civil society, whenever there's repression, will fight back and make sure that we can still put pressure on world leaders in whatever way possible. So look out for that because there will be quite a few in the next two weeks. But it won't be as big as the ones in the past, but we're going to make it big because we know that this COP27 has to count. We need that loss and damage finance facility. We need drastic carbon dioxide emission cuts and we need to get rid of the fossil fuel industry. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all our speakers for a fascinating discussion. Um, Jason and Mitzi and Nazanin in Nairobi. Um, thank you very much.